Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to you all to this afternoon's panel on race, ethnicity, race in the future of genomics, more equity or less. Um, my name is Paul Ramirez. I'm director of the Science and Human Culture Program at Northwestern University. Um, today's panel is part of a partnership we've begun this year with uh, the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity and Equity at Washington University in St. Louis. This partnership aims to examine the intersections of race, science, and medicine through a series of uh, research exchanges and public panels uh, such, as, such as today's. Um, we're particularly interested in, in, in the production of scientific knowledge across the Americas in hemispheric perspective, as well as institutional barriers, practices, and discourses uh, of expertise, uh, gene science, health, and constructions of race and the roles of science in society broadly in the past and the present. My job this afternoon is, is quite simply to introduce our panelists and moderator and then to uh, get out of the way. But before I do that, um, I do have some, some, some thanks uh, to, to, to say on behalf of Billy Acri, who's co-director of the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity and Equity at, at Washington University in St. Louis. We would like to thank uh, the panelists for agreeing to, to join us for this exciting. We're thrilled to, to have you. Uh, we'd like to thank the Klopsteg Lecture Fund for additional financial support for their administrative efforts, John Gabbert, Tila Nagusa, and Janet Hundreiser, who made this event possible. Uh, and last but not least, to those of you in the audience for your interest in these, um, these important, uh, timely questions. Each of our panelists this afternoon will offer brief remarks that situate their work in relation to the topic followed by a moderated conversation, and finally questions from, from you, the audience. The panelists will speak in the order that follows. Um, first, we'll have Brett Merrick. Brett Merrick is Assistant Professor of Genetics at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. He's also a faculty member of the McDonald Genome Institute. Professor Merrick develops community engagement, research, and education programs designed to connect local communities with genomic technology and medicine. With Dr. Chelsea Carter at the Yale School of Public Health, he's conducting a Black genome ethnography that aims to build capacity within Black communities in St. Louis for community-centered genome medicine. In addition, Professor Merrick has taught college-level human genetics and genomics courses in the Illinois and New York State prison systems through the Education Justice Project at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and the Center for Justice at Columbia University. He'll be followed by Alicia Martin. Alicia Martin is an assistant investigator at the Analytic and Translational Genetics Unit at Mass General Hospital. She's also assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and associate member at the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, affiliated with the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research and the Medical and Population Genetics Program. As, the, as a population and statistical geneticist, Professor Martin's research examines the role of human history in shaping global genetic and phenotypic diversity. Given vast geocentric study biases, she investigates the generalizability of knowledge gained from large scale genetic studies across globally diverse populations. Her work develops statistical methods as well as community resources and research capacity for multi ancestry studies, particularly in underrepresented communities to ensure that the translation of genetic technologies not exacerbate health disparities. Santiago Molina is a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the Science and Human Culture Program at Northwestern University with a joint appointment in the Department of Sociology. Dr. Molina's current project is the biopolitics of genome editing. It draws on participant observation, interviews, and archival methods to analyze the institutionalization of CRISPR gene editing technology at the intersection of STS, political sociology, the sociology of racial and ethnic relations, and bioethics. The book shows how scientists adopt CRISPR into their work and describes the ways in which scientists articulate standards of practice that shape what counts as ethical in their work. In collaboration with the Edmund Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard, Dr. Molina is also researching the ways in which scientists across disciplines conceptualize and operationalize human difference through concepts like ancestry and population. Anne Morning is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at New York University, as well as academic director of 19 Washington Square in New York, which is the home of NYU Abu Dhabi in New York. Trained in demography, her research focuses on race, ethnicity, and the sociology of science, especially as they pertain to census classification worldwide and to individuals' concepts of difference. She is the author of The Nature of Race, How Scientists Think and Teach About Human Difference, 
and co-author with Marcello Maneri of the forthcoming An Ugly Word, Rethinking Race in Italy and the United States. From 2013 to 2019, Professor Morning was a member of the US Census Bureau's National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Populations, and has consulted on racial statistics for the European Commission, the United Nations, and Elsevier. She is currently a member of the National, National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Committee on the Use of Race, Ethnicity, and Ancestry as Population Descriptors in Genomics Research. And last but not least, Peter Wade, Professor of Anthropology, Social Anthropology at the University of Manchester. Professor Wade is the author of numerous publications, including a groundbreaking transnational study from, uh, from 2014, excuse me, titled Mestizo Genomics, Race, Mixture, Nation, and Science in Latin America, and most recently, Degrees of Mixture, Degrees of Freedom, Genomics, Multiculturalism, and Race in Latin America. From 2017 to 2019, he co-directed a project on Latin American anti-racism racism in a post-racial age, from which a book is forthcoming in 2022, titled Against Racism, Organizing for Social Change in Latin America. He also directs a project on cultures of anti-racism in Latin America, and is co-investigator on another entitled Comics and Race in Latin America. What a, what a lineup and, and range of expertise. This, uh, this ship is going to be steered uh, this afternoon by uh, Vince Bonham. He's acting, acting deputy director at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Mr. Bonham's research is on the social implications of new genomic knowledge, including the role of genomics in exacerbating or ameliorating racial and ethnic health inequities. Mr. Bonham is leading the Institute's new initiatives to enhance workforce diversity and health equity, as an associate investigator in the Institute's Social and Behavioral Research Branch, he also leads the Health Disparities Unit, which investigates the equitable integration of new genomic knowledge and precision medicine into clinical, clinical settings. Uh, you know, like, like many of our panelists, this is real world applications and implications kinds of, kinds of stuff. He comes to us this afternoon um, uh, hot on the heels of a two-day workshop on genomics and, and health equity research at the Institute, which is to say that we're especially fortunate to have him uh, as moderator at the end of uh, what's been a very busy week. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I'll pass it over to, to Mr. Bonham. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paul. And, and thank you for the invitation to participate and to moderate um, this session today. I am so excited uh, to moderate this panel, this great panel to have this conversation. So I'm just gonna make a couple, a few comments uh, before our, our first panelist uh, gives a five to seven minute conversation about their perspective on these issues. So in 2003, the Human Genome Project was completed and it sequenced the first human genome for more than $1 billion. Today, you can sequence a genome for under $1,000. More than 30 million people have had their genomes sequenced. Sequencing is being used in research and clinical care. As we sequence the genomes globally and the inequities in knowledge of global variation are becoming starker, more than 75% of all the studies of genomics have been conducted on European populations. That makes up approximately 10% of the world population. This results in inequalities and inequities in knowledge of world ancestral genomic variation. As we learn more about the individual genomes in connection with racial and ethnic and social identity, we continue to have a debate. I'm pleased to moderate this session and to have this question about the issues of more equity or less race in the future of genomics. So we'll have our first speaker, um, Brett, if you could go forward. Thank, thank you, Vance. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to start um, just by saying thank you to, to Paul and to um, Billy Acre for, for putting this panel together um, and more generally for the collaboration that they've sparked and that they're building. And um, I know I'm excited to see what evolves um, over the next couple of years and I'm looking forward to participating in more uh, of the things that they're doing. I'd also like to thank Vince for taking time to guide us here uh, through this conversation. I, I, I don't think we could have asked for a better person to, to lead us um, in, in this discussion. And so I'm, I'm excited to, to, to be part of it. Um, I, I want to, I'm going to be fairly brief in my remarks and, and focus on just a couple of points. 
that um, that I learned uh, outside of of my academic training. So following a, a brief postdoc at Columbia, I, I took a job for New York City Health and Hospitals as a uh, essentially a social worker. So um, the, the city had created a program in, in the jail system on Rikers Island called Young Adult Services. And the goal of the program was to um, reach into the jails and work with young people who were at greatest risk for um, uh, poor mental health, poor physical health, excessive violence within the jail system, and were virtually disconnected from from most services that were offered. And, and it was our job as a team to, to reach these young people and to work with them and to provide basic services like you know, letting their mom know how they were because they couldn't use the phone, but also delivering social services, uh, medical, connecting to medical care, mental health, legal team. And so I had the privilege of working in this setting with these young people, 18 to 21 years old, incarcerated for just about three years. And, um, and I learned a whole lot, but I want to focus on two things that I, that, that, really crystallized for me during this time. Um, and the first was that it's really not safe to assume what people want to learn. <laughs> um, I, it, you know, I have a lot of conversations with people about genomics, about medicine, um, about technology. And there seems to be a general sense that there are parts of our society, groups of people in our, in our population who you know, don't want to learn, who don't want to hear about science, who don't, who aren't interested in, um, you know, learning about genomic technology. And, and what I've, what I've always sort of believed to be true is that the opposite, in fact, is, is more likely to be the case, which is that everyone sort of wants to learn as much as they can. <laughs> and it, it only takes an entry point um, to, to get somebody on a path to, to uh, learning. And so I had, a, I had a great opportunity while I was working in the jail system um, to teach genetics um, to young people who hadn't even finished high school. And it was, um, you know, through this process, I learned that, you know, it's, it's just not safe to assume what people will, where people will go with you um, if you take the time to, to provide of, of diversity of entry points to a topic. So that's a, that's a thing that I take with me um, through my work now, um, it is to think about different ways to introduce people to new topics, new technologies, new issues. And the second thing that I learned um, among many things that I wanna highlight is I, I really developed a deeper understanding of what it means to be trustworthy um, and as you can imagine, you know, delivering services to individuals who are in a very vulnerable position depends um, on a certain level of trust between the two people, the person who's providing the services and the person who's receiving the services. And I'd never really experienced a relationship quite like that where the, the, um, the trust grew based on very small, very um, things you might not even think about, right? Like one day I, I met a, a young person and they asked me um, if, I could, if I could reach out to their mom and ask their mom, uh, tell their mom something, right? And so I told the person I would do that. I came back three days later and they asked me if I called their mom and I hadn't fit it into my schedule. Right. And I didn't do it. And at that moment, like the trust that we built over, you know, three weeks or four weeks of working together was 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 gone. And so I really learned that being trustworthy, like really means making small promises over and over and over again and following through on those small promises. And if you're not doing that, then um, the big picture promises that you might want to make or big statements or big dreams that you're going after are they're just not going to happen you're not going to bring people with you if you're not 
um, if you're not trustworthy, like to a T. So I carry that into my work as well. And I think it's extremely important in the work that I do with our communities in St. Louis that, um, that there are like small goals that we can set and that I can, um, I can say, I'm going to do this for you and I'm going to come back and have, have had done that for, for the community. And so that's something that I'm, I'm building into all the projects that I'm currently working on are how do we build trust bit by bit to the point where um, I'm a trustworthy person in the community. And as a representative of Washington University and the McDonald Genome Institute, you know, they are trustworthy institutions in the community as well. And so my, my role at MGI, the McDonald Genome Institute, is really to help create an environment that can adapt to the pace of genomic medicine and precision medicine. It's also to hold these institutions accountable for the needs and desires and concerns of the community. Um, uh, my work is focused largely on communities of color. And so I'm collaborating with um, uh, a woman of color, Chelsea Carter, who is from St. Louis. She's just starting her assistant professorship at Yale School of Public Health. She's a medical anthropologist and together we're starting to do um, sort of rapid eth ethnographies in the St. Louis community to learn uh, how people feel about advances in genomics, but also to build capacity in the community uh, so that they can engage with genomic research and then also its use in medicine. So I'll stop there. I uh, just want to say that I'm super excited to be here. I look forward to the conversation and um, very, feel very privileged to uh, share ideas with everyone here. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Brett. Um, so we'll go to Alicia now. Great, thanks so much. Um, I'm delighted to be here and first want to start by thanking uh, the organizers here for putting together such a phen phenomenal panel that I feel really privileged to be a part of. Um, I'm going to share a couple of slides starting uh, just kicking off with a few ideas from um, my perspective as a human geneticist. So, you know, again, thanks so much for having having me. Um, as a human geneticist, I kind of want to start at the beginning and thinking about this from the human genetics angle and first start by just saying race and ethnicity are clearly not the same thing as ancestry. Um, well, we have to start in thinking from human genetics with the perspective of where our species um, came from. So our species uh, originated in Africa. I think it's important to acknowledge right up front that humans from a DNA perspective are 99.9% .9 identical no matter where we're from. Um, and the ancestry studies really look at a tiny fraction of DNA that may differ across populations. This is purely determined by genetics, by our ancestors. It's not the same as race or ethnicity, which are forms of our identities um, that either we self-identify as or society um, imposes on us. So these ancestry patterns then are determined by human history, how humans uh, originated in Africa and then migrated out of Africa into the Middle East, into Eurasia, into the Americas and so on over the span of hundreds of thousands of years. So when we study ancestry, we're usually looking at these minute differences um, across the genome. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that there's no distinct categories of ancestry. Ancestry is a continuum. Um, and so binning people into different discrete groups doesn't make a whole lot of sense, uh, at least from a genetics perspective. So I wanna just keep that in mind throughout the um, discussions we have here. Another thing I think that Fence, you know, very astutely noted at the outset of this is that our genetic studies have been enormously Eurocentric. So participants in large scale genome wide association studies, which have just grown exponentially and have provided phenomenal insights into the biomedical basis of disease have been vastly Eurocentric to date. So about 80% of participants in genome wide association studies are participants of European descent, which is really out of step with the global population where they make up about 16% or so of, of the global population. And even more problematically, if we want to understand the genetic basis of disease, our key ingredient is genetic variation. And since around 2014 or so, our diversifying progress has stalled or even slid in the wrong direction if diversity is a key ingredient here. So a key part of my work is trying to understand how do these ancestry study biases and genetics impact the generalizability of our knowledge, what we can actually learn from these big genetic studies and how you can actually translate that in the biomedical domain. 
So I think there's some really important considerations here. First is that we fundamentally expect causal variants to mostly be shared across populations. So maybe this will play forward um, when Dr. Molina is discussing CRISPR variants, for example, but if we impose the same CRISPR change in different uh, genomes, we would fundamentally expect that to have roughly the same effect no matter someone's um, population, no matter someone's ancestry. But because of how humans populated the globe, there's really complicated kind of differences with genetic correlations and differences in allele frequency across the globe, really complicated environmental differences and natural selection differences that all kind of complicate how we actually translate and think about these genetic studies um, in different populations. So I'm really excited about genetics, otherwise I wouldn't be in this field. It's been just a phenomenal explosion, um, I think in the last decade or so, in terms of providing objective biomarkers. I see genetics as offering two massive um, lines of insight. So the first is about insights into disease mechanism. And then the second I think of is offering a risk prediction stratification tool uh, for, to understand the genetic basis of disease and how people might have higher or lower risk. So when we conduct our genetic studies, we typically have patients with some disease or some disorder and non-patients or controls without that uh, disease or disorder. We have their DNA and we're fundamentally going through looking at every single genetic variant that we can uh, assay in the genome and are asking, is there a particular genetic variant that's more associated with disease or not? Um, you'll see that there's multiple different signals that pop up in the genome though. Most of the diseases that we're really interested in are really complex, really polygenic. So many different genetic variants contribute from across the genome to influence things like cardiovascular disease and type two diabetes and schizophrenia and autoimmune disease. So with that in mind, we often construct these tools called polygenic scores, which can predict the risk that an individual might have a disease from their DNA. Now, when we put these things together, we end up with, uh, these sorts of distributions for people who come from the control distribution or who are healthy, and those people who come from the case distribution or those people who might have a disease. So in general, um, those people who are at higher risk have more genetic risk variants, and those people at lower risk have fewer genetic risk variants. But really, it's only in the tails that you're seeing the separation, and there's a lot of overlap. So we can't just use your genetic data to say, this is your destiny, this is your outcome. In fact, there's a whole lot more going on, especially when we're thinking about health disparities, that's impacting whether you're likely to get a disease or um, have a negative outcome. People have been talking about these technologies and have been starting to translate these um, in medicine already in several different domains. So first in thinking about research and deeply phenotype settings. So maybe in a big genetic study, we can determine you know, case control, control status for cardiovascular disease, but maybe we really wanna know about your readmission rates, how likely you are to be hospitalized, how likely you are to respond to surgery or different drugs. So that's one, um, you know, implementation that we're really excited about. Another is for clinical trials, which are incredibly expensive. So this can be made more efficient by targeting those individuals at highest genetic predisposition uh, for disease. The area that's gotten the most attention lately is in preventative medicine. So just like a blood draw where maybe you can learn your LDL levels and you can integrate your BMI and your smoking status and all these sorts of factors for predicting cardiovascular disease. Your genetic data is as predictive right now as many of these different risk factors and is getting incorporated into these uh, risk models. So when you go to the doctor, um, this might be part of your routine screening um, for determining whether you should have, be on statins, for example, or not. Um, this is a vitally dubious conversation that I don't think we need to get into are extensions, maybe in the social domain, thinking about things like embryo selection, which I think are currently too problematic to consider. The biggest problem, um, yet the most exciting area that I see is that we have this phenomenal tool where we might be able to think about um, predicting your many different diseases using um, these polygenic scores, for example, but that they're so staggeringly different in accuracy across different populations. We can predict European ancestry traits about twice as accurately as in East Asian ancestry individuals and about four to five times as accurately as, as in African ancestry individuals. So I see this as the biggest challenge to the implementation of genetics and precision medicine. Right now, things are so inequitable um, using genetic studies that we have a long ways to go.
Um, I realize I'm sort of short on time, so I just want to say there's a lot of needs and a lot of opportunities. Um, genetics is not how we're going to solve health disparities, so I think we need to work hard in genetics to make sure that it's in fact not exacerbating those gaps. Um, thanks so much and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Alicia. So Santiago. Thanks. Just definitely want to echo everybody's gratitude. It's definitely a privilege to be here. And um, I'll keep my remarks short. And I will confess it's not really my strong suit. So I'll, I'll do I'll do what I can. So um, as Paul mentioned, I'm a sociologist uh, with a background in philosophy of science and do work at the intersection of STS, polit political sociology, and bioethics. Um, and I'll comment on, on, on two of my current projects um, and open up with one uh, normative claim about what we might be talking about in the next hour. Um, so as part of this uh, collaborative project with the Safra Center at Harvard, I'm studying how researchers in the population sciences broadly understood as like including population genetics, genetic epidemiology, public health, demography, sociology, physical anthropology, use and talk about ancestry and I really appreciated Alicia's clarification here that ancestry is separate from race and ethnicity. And in this project, we're really trying to interrogate, okay, but then what do people actually mean by ancestry? And we developed an original data set of studies across these fields from the last five years, publications um, that use the concept and analyze these articles qualitatively. And we've then interviewed a subset of these authors about their research their choices of population label and the challenges they face. And I wanna start with this kind of empirical understanding because I think it's important to understand, okay, what, what do people actually mean when they use the term ancestry and how is it different? And sociologists would definitely start with from the idea that, oh, what this is gonna look like is that different disciplines have different understandings of ancestry. So if you interview a doctor, he's gonna think one thing. If you, we interview Alicia or a population geneticist, we're gonna get something else. And if we interview me, you're going to get a totally different answer. Ancestry is going to mean something different to these groups. And that's kind of one of the things that I started thinking when we, when we went into it. Um, but what we've actually found is that there's just as much difference within fields as there are between fields. And that people aren't consistent in their understanding of ancestry, even within the same interview. And people jump around, not just between like race and ethnicity, but between race, ethnicity, and nation, for example, and thinking about the contributions of like different political barriers to reproduction. And in terms of their use, ancestry is used in a lot of different contexts for a lot of different things. And it's kind of a, a flexible concept in that way in, the, in that we can use it epistemologically to make a lot of inferences about human difference. And one of the takeaways that we're trying to figure out is that, okay, what would that mean if we were to try to come up with normative recommendations for how you use ancestry or how you want to talk about ancestry. Because if the solution here is to, okay, we need to just agree on terms and we need to just like come up with great definitions, that might get us somewhere. But mo more likely than not, how the concepts end up, end up being used um, are really different. And one of my favorite questions that I've been asking interviewees is where would they point somebody who was either in either a member of the public or say like a, a junior colleague of theirs or a student. Like if, if I came up to, to, to Anne, for example, as a sociologist and I said, hey, like what could I read that could help me clarify these concepts? Like where could I go to learn about, you know, how these things are related? And what we found is that most of the people working in the space weren't exposed to the concepts at all or had to come up with their own understanding. And so in their responses, they, they're like, oh, well, I have like a couple of papers that I might refer people to, but what we were really trying to find is, are there any guidelines or anything like that that they might normatively point towards as like, here are, here's a place where you can find some answers. And of course, normative guidelines didn't really come up, which pushes this, this more open-ended question about, well, where would people go to? And if we, if if all of us here came together and agreed, okay, let's come up with some normative recommendations and some guidelines for people. More likely than not, people aren't going to come looking for our, 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 you know, our principles or something like that. And so, how would we actually change the way that people are talking about or thinking about these concepts? 
Um, and so that's one question. Um, the second is about this, this idea of um, racial biopolitics that, that I work on with, with genome editing. Um, and here my one sort of normative suggestion for those of us working on these issues is that we more explicitly name and identify the ways in which whiteness organizes and shapes genomic research. And what I mean by that? I mean that the way that white saviorism, white fear, paternalism, and covert forms, forms of racism can shape how scientists evaluate research, both in peer review, such as evaluating candidates for like um, academic positions, setting funding priorities, but also in how data about racial health disparities are, are interpreted more broadly by white publics. My, kind of, my claim here is that whiteness is kind of finicky. For example, one research article, recent article by uh, Skinner, Dirk and et al. in Social Science and Medicine found that uh, when white Americans were exposed to information about COVID-19 racial disparities, it actually reduced their empathy for COVID-19 patients. It reduced support for safety precautions and reduced their fear of COVID-19 in general. And they suggest that publicizing racial health disparities has the potential to create a vicious cycle wherein raising awareness actually reduces support for policies that could reduce disparities. And while this is like only a COVID related study, I would put my money on the generalizability on these findings. And I think it's important for us to think about how claims of human difference, genetics and health will be interpreted. Um, and also what the motivations of doing that research are in the first place. Like if they're motivated primarily from like white guilt, like I think there's a, there's a, a philosophical and emotional problem attached to, to the way that we're going to be solving those issues. Um, not in there, and I'm really just looking forward to the conversation more broadly. Um, I didn't talk too much about genome editing because I think it's open up enough a whole other can of worms, but I'm happy to do that during the panel. Thank you. And? Great. I again want to add my thanks to the organizers for just being a part of this terrific conversation. And for me, it's it's especially neat to be back in this because I'm I'm in a sense coming to this topic again after something of a hiatus in which I finished a book on Italy and on how Italians conceptualize race. And that was interesting because that's a space where race is much less geneticized than it is in the United States. Um, so it's sort of nice to be back in the mix in connection with my research on the relationship between scientific and popular beliefs about race. Um, as Vince, uh, Vince Bonham also mentioned, um, there is a new National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine Committee, uh, which I'm honored to be a part of, which is looking at the uh, uses of race, ethnicity, ancestry, and other population descriptors in genomic research. And although I, you know, I, I can't say anything about the private deliberations, and I'm, I'm certainly not representing anybody here other than myself. Um, certainly, I think my remarks today are going to be shaped by some of the the public sessions we've held, the conversations we've been able to have so far with interested members of the public. And I want to certainly encourage any of you on this call, um, if you haven't already, to check out the work of that uh, committee. Our public sessions have been recorded; they're available online, and we'll have another one in June. And it would just be wonderful to have all of you join that conversation. So um, to jump right into the, the topic today of race and the future of genomics, I have to say, I found this title a little daunting. I don't really feel like I'm well placed to speculate on the future of genomics writ large. Um, so I sort of have cut down my, uh, my brief to uh, a talk on a few comments on what I'll call the foreseeable future of race in genomics. And in that connection, I'd like to make four points uh, in these opening remarks. Uh, the first point that I'd like to make simply is to suggest that race will continue to be used in genomics and in other sciences as long as it has social and political utility. Race, I think as we, we all know, is a belief about the human body that came into being in the West in order to make sense of and justify a particular set of economic, political, and social arrangements. That was, of course, the historical setting of European expansionism, colonialism, the enslavement and subjugation of non-European peoples from the 15th century forward. And of course, race was a way to make those br the brutal inequalities of those um, enterprises seem natural and inevitable and unproblematic. And I think what is most striking in our history of Western racial thought is that even though 
the scientific basis of race gets debunked time and time again, the idea never goes away, right? So the old ideas about race and skull shape failed. The old conjectures about race and blood or blood type also gone by the wayside. Same with old ideas about race and IQ. But nonetheless, here we are. So what we see is that from the historical record that when the scientific evidence for the idea of racial groups didn't pan out, the notion of race wasn't discarded. And instead what happened was people kept hoping that newer, sexier, more authoritative, uh, shinier and prestigious sciences would step in and demonstrate the reality of race. And that's why we're having a conversation today about race and genomics. The fact that we hold on to racial categories in our science, even when we don't find the, the evidentiary basis for them, it tells us that the persistence of racial thought is coming from somewhere else. It's not coming from our increasing knowledge of the natural world, but instead it's coming from the way in which we want to make sense of the social world and the ways in which we're trying to, to shape and impose order on that social world. So what does that mean then for our question of more equity or less? That brings me to the second point that I'd like to make today, which is that unless race is explicitly and consciously harnessed for anti-racist purposes, it will produce more inequality and not less. So the continued use of race in genomics and other sciences and in society at large certainly is an engine of inequity unless we develop a clear-eyed view of how we're using race and racial labels and how those uses are going to promote a more equitable society. So the unthinking, automatic, business as usual use of race is not going to get us there. So what do I mean by taking a clear-eyed view of race that would allow us to harness it for anti-racist purposes? So this will bring me to my two last points. The first uh, uh, is that we have to keep in mind that race reflects social status not patterns of human biological variation, as the speakers before me have made amply clear. So a rethinking of the place of race and genomics entails in identifying those places, those uses where we might use race for its social data. So the kinds of inquiries where we want to have that information, let's say that reflects, for example, exposure to discrimination or sort of status in the racialized hierarchy that is our society, and we've got to distinguish those kinds of uses of race from the sorts of inquiries in which we are not using or tapping into or needing that kind of social data. And I think there is this kind of general idea that, um, that because genomics research today often, not always, but often has health related objectives, that somehow it gives carte blanche to the field to use race. But really what we need to be thinking about is where race is useful as an indicator of social status and, and cordon that off from or be clear about that as a different kind of enterprise than trying to use race as a proxy for biological variation. And that brings me to my last point, which is that the inability of race, of racial categories to capture the richness and the subtlety of human genetic variation is well known, right? There's no mystery there. And how could it be otherwise, right? Because the racial categories that we have come to us from an 18th century reworking of the theory of the four humors, millennia old, an idea that basically gave us the white, black, yellow, red categories that are still at the foundations of the racial categories that we use today that are enshrined in our federal ra racial classification categories. So with that kind of pedigree, it's not surprising that racial categories don't do the work that we need of really taking the measure of human biological variation. And so for, for me, the really interesting question is, and this is what I, I, I would like to leave you with is, what are the alternative tools for capturing human biological variation that have been overshadowed by our unthinking reliance on the familiar old race categories, right? What tools do we have that we might use more widely to, to reflect that the realities of human genetic variation? And what tools have we maybe not even tried to develop because we were enthralled to race? So I'll, I wanna leave you simply with the thought that I think we need to be creative and forward thinking as we consider how genomics might contribute to a more equitable future. So thank you. Thank you for those comments. And our last uh, panelist, Peter. 
Uh, okay, so thank you. That's been really, I've been really interested and fascinated to, uh, to listen to these conversations. Um, and I'd also like to echo the thanks to Paul and Billy for the, um, the invitation and also to Vance for, for moderating. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, Latin America, about the research we did in Latin America, in Brazil and Colombia and Mexico, where we were looking at how um, genomic practice, what scientists did and how what the knowledge that they produced filtered into the public sphere, how that reproduced or didn't reproduce categories of race but also ethnicity and, and nation, and therefore potentially uh, reinforce the racism that, that depends on these kinds of categories. And what we found um, in Latin America was uh, a very strong, almost one could say obsessive focus on mixture on Latin American populations as mixed, uh, which was constantly reiterated. Um, and that was you know, interesting in the light of having been perhaps 30 years or 20 or 30 years of um, of social movements and you know, multiculturalist reform in Latin America, which highlighted the presence of uh, of black and indigenous populations. So this was a restatement of, you know, the kind of traditional knowledge that these nations were actually mixed nations. And in that process, there was a constant reiteration of the basic categories of uh, African Native American and European ancestry. Um, this was both in scientific papers, which uh, geneticists might be reading with a kind of technical knowledge of what was what they meant by ancestry, but it was also in more popular publications, uh, newspapers, popular science mags, uh, websites, including websites that were dedicated to recruiting people to uh, to as sample as um, as, for, as to, for sampling purposes for these genomic projects. I'll just I'll just briefly share a screen um, that shows you you know this kind of representation uh, of Mexico. This is of Mexico with these um, each pie chart represents a, pop a population sample from a state of Mexico, and the constant reiteration of these kinds of uh, of, of categories, uh, and that's from a kind of website. But also, if you look at more um, uh, technical papers. This was in, in PLOS. You know, you get this Europe and Africa, America, the constant re restatement of these um, of these categories that are very easily mapped onto familiar ideas about races, about uh, African and Native American and European races. So underlying this, I think, was a more fundamental issue about simply the very the use of social categories or socially defined populations whether these were broad continental populations or more specific and local populations to define sampling strategies and to label the samples that the uh, the geneticists put in plastic boxes and put in freezers now this seems kind of uh, perhaps obvious and maybe even unavoidable to you know to, to sample populations on the basis of uh, their social um, identities, but inevitably I think it creates a basic symmetry between social identity, locality and genetics, and it tends to present populations as separate entities, as kind of islands, despite the geneticist's simultaneous recognition that, as um, Alicia was saying, uh, that genetic human variation is mostly clinal in form and that populations overla overlap to a great extent. Now that kind of symmetry of social identity and genetics was reinforced by sampling techniques that aimed to get at what can only be described as a pure sample, although that, um, that idea of purity is you know, genetically meaningless really. So when Mexican scientists, for example, wanted to uh, get a sample of a Native American population so that they could test the, the ancestry of mixed populations, they went to uh, a Zapotec village which was socially defined as Zapotec, and by, it was recognized by the government as Zapotec, and the people in the village called themselves Zapotec. And in that, they only sampled people whose four grandparents had also been born in that locality and also spoke Zapotec. So some people who were sampled as indigenous in this way were then excluded from the sample if they were genetically um, close to those who they were sampling as mestizos, a non Zapotec people. Now this could be seen as a kind of reasonable practice if you want a sample that is in your, you know, it's going to stand in as a proxy for a pure Native American ancestry compared to African or European ancestries. But it's also a technique that inevitably 
reproduces a kind of congruence between social and biological categories and reifies, um, gives a, biologically reifies what is in fact a social category. Now, what, I mean, what interests me is that some geneticists, um, for example, Kenneth Wise, recognize these kinds of dangers and he has protested as, and I quote him from an article, uh, what he calls the selective de, 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 de facto typological sampling and the assumption of statistically homogeneous source populations, which is involved in the measurement of these mixed ancestries, which was the very common process. Measuring admixed ancestries, as I've said, was extremely common in population genetic research in Latin America. And um, I mean, to quote another well-known geneticist, Arav Arav uh, Aravinda Chakravati, he says, um, Human evolution has always been studied with respect to such populations defined by language, geography, or cultural and physical features. Consider instead what we could decipher if we were to sample, say, a million humans without regards to who they were across a virtual grid across the world. These types of global surveys of diversity have been performed for other species and may provide the first objective description of ours of our species, bereft of race or other uh, labels. And I'll just finish with um, an interesting contrary case, which comes from um, Brazil, where a Brazilian geneticist called Sergio Pena uh, was very insistent on using genetic data to undermine the whole idea of race and to undermine the idea that the categories, the color categories that are used in the Brazilian census, for example, had any kind of genetic meaning to them. Uh, word biologically co coherent in any way. Now, despite this, one, he, you know, his, his approach, his own approach, also encountered the problems noted ab above of the constant reiteration of these sort of ancestral populations. But that's not the point that I want to make in relation to him. The problem with him was that he insisted that social policy had to follow the lessons that science provided. That is to say that races didn't exist scientifically, therefore, he said, they shouldn't and couldn't exist um, sociologically. And people use the data that he provided, and he himself used his own data to argue action policy, policies and programs that the Brazilian state was putting into place to try and redress the uh, very evident social inequalities around race that exist in Brazil. So a genetic message that appeared to be on the side of kind of greater equity by denying racial categories in the end um, produced less equity by undermining reparative measures that sought to correct racialized inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And, and thank you to all of the panelists. Um, so I would like to, to first ask all the individuals who are watching this, if you have questions, please put your questions uh, in the, the Q&A and so that we can engage in a conversation with you as we move forward throughout the next hour. But let's just start as a panel and have a conversation. And I, I kind of like to have this be like that we're all having wine and we're sitting at the a table together and we're having a, a conversation and, and really um, pushing each other and uh, with regards to some of the comments that were made. So I am opening up for my panelists to also ask other panelists questions. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna start with Dr. Morning. And, and um, you know, you talked about um, different tools and need for new tools. So can, can you tell us what kind of tools you think can move us beyond race? Thank you so much. And here uh, again, I'm really um, drawing on some of the things that have come out in conversation with colleagues in, in genetics, in uh, epidemiology, um, in other social sciences that we've been having over the last couple of weeks in connection with this National Academies. Uh, panel that I mentioned, but I think also got echoed in Peter Wade's comments just now. So um, I'll pick up where Peter left off. He mentioned Aravinda Chakravarti's idea of grid sampling, which, and I should say, Dr. Chakravarti is actually one of the co-chairs of our uh, National Academy's uh, committee on the use of population descriptors. So that idea, for example, of um, of not just creating samples. So first of all, the importance of creating samples that are geographically representative, that sort of bring in population or bring in individuals um, at random in some sense is important. But on top of it, it suggests then privileging geography, sort of location as a way of thinking about or gauging 
populations rather than falling back on these very blunt kind of categories of race. So that's one that comes to mind. Another um, idea that I've heard colleagues uh, speak about has to do with trying to work with measures of relatedness. Um, and I think even, you know, I don't think in this particular panel we've talked so far, I, I don't think much about principal components analyses where one attempts to make a sense of, to, uh, to come to a sense of population structure, uh, I guess you could say mathematically, but what's interesting about those attempts is that while I think they have been hailed as methods that get us away from race or ethnic labels, that sometimes what happens is that those results, sort of the, the resultant um, kinds of groupings then get relabeled or, or have something like a racial or ethnic label attached to them later, even when that was ne not necessary. So, um, and one maybe one other thing that I'll also suggest that has less to do with the um, technicalities of how genomic research might um, be conducted is another insight that came in a, a public session Pilar Osorio, which is simply the idea that perhaps rather than thinking or looking for some standard universal set of categories that we can use or groupings that we can, we can apply across the world, perhaps we need to take more seriously um, the idea that we are going to be developing different categorization schemes as needed for particular inquiries at hand. Um, so those are some of the ideas that I've been hearing in my conversations, Vince, that, um, that are inspiring me to think about, okay, what are, what are the things we could be doing other than relying on racial categories? Okay, thanks. So, so Brett and Alicia, what do you think of that as two geneticists? Uh, Alicia, do you want, yeah, sure. Um, I, I, I love the idea of grid sampling. Um, I think it's, it's, it's it's um, such a. I mean, there's many ways you could implement that that make sense to me. I think uh, Anne pointing out geography as a potential uh, sort of variable of interest rather than race is is great. I think there's others too that that you could use. I think you're, the last point you made about sort of mm, I don't know if we would could call them ad hoc classification schemes. But I actually find that to be really compelling too, um, not just in genetics, but I mean, uh, you know, I was involved in a, a fairly a countywide COVID nineteen prevalence um, study early in in the pandemic, and um, the attempts that were made to use race, income level, educational attainment to explain disparities in in COVID nineteen. Uh, prevalence were, you know, often fell short, and and I it it occurred to me then, sort of this sense that you know what these beyond race even like some of these things like asking a person's you know uh, household income and trying to correlate that with some biological thing just is is fraught and it's it's uh, limited and and so I really like the idea of potentially. Um, creating classification schemes that fit the questions that are being asked. And I, I, I haven't really seen that done. So I really like that idea a lot. And again, I want to give credit to Pilar Osorio for that, but I want to say maybe instead of, you're right, maybe instead of saying ad hoc classification, maybe we call them tailored classifications. Yeah, perfect. Maybe that might right. sound better, but yeah. Thank you. Um, this might take it in a slightly different direction, but thinking about this, um, there's one area that my group is trying to grow in, and that is in thinking about um, genetic association studies, there's often a whole lot that's left on the table that race is used as a proxy for. So genetics is a slippery field where oftentimes we need ancestry as a concept, and then we're trying to understand the biomedical basis of some disease, and race is often a proxy variable for a whole lot of other societal factors. Um, there's been a lot of really interesting uh, work lately on chronic kidney disease and the idea that race adjustment in medicine is necessary. Well, there's been a big move to um, shift our, how we're actually, um, you know, determining kidney function uh, using other measures that don't need race corrections or that move away from that. 
But I would challenge us to think beyond kidney disease and think about all disease um, and what measures are actually like a better proxy for um, the fundamental biomedical basis of disease. So maybe raises a proxy variable for income, maybe raises a proxy variable for exposures, for access to healthcare, for access to healthy foods and all sorts of different factors. And I think we're just scratching like the tip of the iceberg right now um, in our big studies with this explosion of biomedical data. And genomics has been great at leading the forefront, I think of aggregating genomic data because it's reproducible, it's measurable with the same technology. If you ask someone the same question about their income, you'll have different scales with different people who you're asking this question to, and it gets really hard to understand what income means in different places in the US even. So I think genetics has led the charge partially because it's standardizable of bringing so much data together, but we really need to move beyond just genetics if we're trying to actually move genomics forward in an equitable way. Um, and so that's that's something that my lab is trying to think about is just how do we bring the wealth of knowledge that we're learning from genetics together without using race as a proxy variable, but instead to try to really dig in and understand deeply why health disparities exist um, across different groups, across socioeconomic strata, across all sorts of different um, aspects of our society um, and what's really going on there. Um, I also, you know, one thing I really liked is just a comment uh, that was raised earlier is that, you know, I think Dr. Molina mentioned that we've uh, talked about race societally, especially for um, COVID-19 and disparities. And that actually led to kind of less empathy societally, which is super problematic. Um, I think one other thing that it just sort of jarred in my mind and maybe other, other folks have thoughts about is that sometimes when we stick our heads in the sand about race, which happens a lot in the field of genetics, um, because it's so slippery and it's hard to get the language uh, or hard to get the concepts really straight in everybody's mind, um, sometimes that actually leads to less equity. So without actually considering uh, racial differences, then people are thinking about prevalence differences and they're like, okay, well, in this population, I'm doing a really good job at predicting when in fact, like, no, that disease is just really prevalent in that population. So, and there's also some countries that have been thinking about doing away with uh, race on a lot of um, health, in, uh, health uh, admission forms. And that's actually led to more difficulties in understanding um, where there are disparities and what the basis of those disparities are. So I'm trying to think about as if, you know, with my lab and in discussions with other colleagues, um, how can we best understand disparities generally while being very clear um, what the biological mechanisms are and how those are distinct from the social mechanisms um, and how we can actually advance uh, together to reduce uh, those disparities. So just some food for thought and I'd love to hear other panelists thoughts on that. <laughs> right. So, and I'm going to go to the other panelists, but I, I do want to do some, um, just making sure there's some level foundation, because uh, I don't know who all is listening to this. So, and I'm actually going to go back to you, Alicia. Can you, can you define three terms for me? One is genetics, genomics, and then polygenetic risk scores. Sure. Um, genetics and genomics, you can like talk about what the differences are, but really I've just kind of thought of it like genomics is like the explosive exploding term with the growth of data. Usually we're thinking about like sequencing or massive studies when we're thinking about genomics. Genetics we're often thinking sort of smaller scale earlier on, like maybe GWAS arrays or maybe single uh, genetic variants. Um, and then polygenic spores are aggregations of effects that we're learning in big genetic studies to predict risk of disease using your genetic data alone. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> no, that, that is extremely helpful. And, and it kind of leads to the question with polygenetic risk scores of, of the use of race and the use of ancestry and, and what do we think about ancestry and, and both Peter and Santiago kind of really raised this question about ancestry in a way. And I, I guess Santiago, I want to start with you. Um, you know, uh, the question of ancestry and race is, you know, it's part of the conversation that's going on in all of the debate right now. You know, how do you see this issue of the use of ancestry instead of race? Um, <clears throat> just interesting from our interviews. One of the things that we find is people are trying to avoid racial categories because they think it's sticky and they don't want to get called out. And so there's kind of like a sense that it's a more neutral term. And I think 
a lot of what we're trying to do is push against this idea that ancestry is somehow a more neutral way of thinking about human difference because it is so culturally rich that people end up putting into that idea a lot of different things. And what's been surprising is that when we've asked, and these are experts, these are folks who work with, the, with health disparities on a number of things, or that are public health scientists and they've been thinking very deeply about the relationship between social and biological determinants of health. When we ask them what they mean by, ethnic, by ancestry, a lot of them will say, well, like for me, my parents are from Spain and like their aunt, like, and like, or like they'll, they'll go into like a personal narrative about their own, their own identity. And that to me just indicates that very much it's, it's, a, it's a personal biographical concept. And part of what's interesting is that like ancestry, like Alicia pointed out is, is there's no typology that comes with it. And it's also very specific to the time scale that you're thinking about it biologically. So if you were to try to come up with ancestral populations, someone's like, okay, well, what, who, what is your ancestry? You really have to ask like, well, how far back do you want me to go? And if you look at that map that Alicia pointed out, like that's kind of like the reductionistic understanding of like where our evolution came from, but it's actually so much messier than that. And like any historian will tell you that people have been migrating and moving around all over the place since as long as we've been around, like I don't think we, we're really good at staying in one place. Um, I think of ancestry in terms of this as kind of like a way of thinking about the intersection of like multiple forms of difference. And I do think that it's a more useful framework once we recognize that it's not just race, that it's also ethnicity, it's also language, it's also nationality, and that all of those things could be bad in a certain context, like in terms of their use, like reifying political categories is also morally objectionable because na national borders are very contested. And, it, and Peter Wade's research, I mean, this has been one of the books that really got me like into the topic in the first place because it's very much present in, in, present in, in Mexico or in Brazil that like the idea of a Brazilian genome or a Mexican genome just makes little sense biologically, but it's nonetheless a very tractable idea, which as Anne said, is likely to continue to be so as long as it's, as long as it's politically useful. Um, so that's kind of how I think about it. And, and obviously the, the, what that produces is kind of this linguistic problem, which is like, okay, so what do we mean when we say ancestry and can we distinguish between different kinds of ancestry or different types of ancestry. And, and we're trying to do that empirically in our project, but it's definitely been a bit of a challenge because people say by a geographic ancestry, people think of like ancestry as like a cultural thing. There's like a more, um, some people just want to say it's like a social thing. And then some people really want to say, no, it's a biological thing. And so like, it's hard for those understandings to coexist in some clean way. Thank you. So, Peter, what do you think of what Santiago and the others have had to say about these issues in the context of your work in Latin America? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in Latin America, you know, the, the whole concept of race is particularly <coughs> ambiguous and ambivalent. So, on the one hand, it's, you know, it's relatively easy to find the word um, there's a there's a, a metro station in Mexico City called La Raza, for example, the race. But in that sense, it's talking about the whole, you know, the the, the Mexican people as a race. Um, so it's in that sense, it's both a historical, social, and biological concept, and it kind of you know mixes all those three things together in a kind of <clears throat> almost 18th century way, I suppose, or 19th century way. Um, it doesn't separate out the, the social and the biological, as you know we're, we're accustomed to doing so, at least from the late 19th, 19th century and into the 20th century in, in, in Western science, <clears throat> where there's a very clear division between biology and, 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 um, and the social, at least until epigenetics came along. Um, so it's, it's, on the one hand, then it's both social, it's kind of a fuzzy concept. On the other hand, 
It's also, you can find it quite easily. Like I said, you know, there are metro stations called La Raza and people will talk about La Raza Indígena, the indigenous race, La Raza Negra, La Raza India and so on. So you people, you know, quite familiar with talking about that term. The term is also used to describe a breed, what we would call a breed of, of dog or horse. Que raza es tu perro? You'd say, you'd say, what breed of dog, you know, what race is your dog? Um, so it's, you know, it's common in that sense. On the other hand, it's also kind of politically quite toxic. And so people don't talk about race in public life and in political life in the same way as they do in the United States, where you can talk about racial politics in, in quite an open way. So in that sense, when the geneticists never wanted to talk about race or use that word, and they would be very sort of uncomfortable when you talk, you know, when you try to introduce the topic of race into the conversation. So for them, the notion of ancestry was kind of sent from heaven as a way to talk about these things uh, without really talking about them. And um, I mean, like Santiago was saying, also the notion of, of nation was a way of kind of addressing questions of, of race in their kind of uh, um, subterranean way without really addressing the, the question head on. If you talked about you know, uh, the, the, the Mexican people or the Brazilian people and the, then the Brazilian genome and the Mexican genome, you know, you could talk about things that raised issues or, that would be from you know, a North American or European point of view would look like race without really mentioning the topic at all. So yeah, in that sense, I think I did, we didn't look in any detail as to what people meant when they talked about ancestry, like, you know, we didn't do the, the fine grained analysis that uh, Santiago has done on what people meant by ancestry, but they certainly, the geneticists used it in that, in that way to not talk about race. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask my colleagues to ask each other questions that you might wanna ask about um, the conversation that we're having. I had uh, one question for, for Alicia and Brett, and this is again kind of in the spirit of Vince's earlier question about what other tools are out there. Um, I was wondering if you have encountered research or where there are measures of racism, not necessarily of race, being used alongside genetic data. And if you if you have, what have those studies looked like? And if you haven't, um, what would a measure of the experience of racism add to the to your studies in terms of as, as like a as a variable because i think so it's something that sociologists think about a lot but i think we're not really great at like exporting our tools in a way that's really tractable for other folks and i think it would be interesting to see where that would take us in terms of an alternative if we're not just studying like race itself but like the whole system of exploitation and that surrounds it, you know? Um, one area where I've seen this applied is not necessarily a direct question of how do you experience racism, for example, alongside uh, genetic risk factors for thinking about disease or something like that, or some trait, but instead um, taking kind of holistic approaches, for example, of like the exposome. So aggregating many different environmental exposures and measures. Um, there's been some interesting work that I've seen from a colleague I really enjoy working with, uh, Dr. Chirag Patel, um, who's been leading some work on this. Um, and that's like also an area that we wanna move into and start to collaborate on is just to understand how do these kind of fit together. But in terms of how much work is out there, um, these fields tend to not talk to each other quite as much. Um, there's a really wonderful consortium also, the Social Sciences Genomics Aggregation Consortium that brings together a lot of sociologists with a lot of geneticists to think through some of these problems deeply. Um, and they often put together things like frequently asked questions for studies that are particularly thorny um, and are particularly uh, touching on really sensitive um, phenotypes that have really racial notions kind of attached to them, um, things like educational attainment and studying that from a genetics perspective, for example. So um, they, I think, have kind of tried to put together some nice commentary around that um, and, and describe exactly what is meant by the studies a little bit more deeply. But um, I, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done, and I think there will be a lot more work done in the next five years or so.
Yeah, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Alicia's last remark for sure. There's, there's a lot, <clears throat> there's a lot of loose ends right now. A lot of sort of like bits and pieces of things that I, that <clears throat> I hear people talk about. Um, <clears throat> I think one thing that often comes up when this subject arises, Santiago is like the weathering hypothesis, right? Like this isn't, this is an idea that people seem to speak on as a, as a response to this. And it's like the idea that, you know, there's an accumulation of stress um, uh, in, in individuals that experience marginalization or trauma and that this somehow, uh, you know, it is, is played out biologically. And we're clearly seeing that in certain places. I mean, we're looking at things like if you read, uh, you know, about infant mortality, maternal health, there's clear disparities in, uh, in, in infant mortality and maternal health between black Americans and, and white Americans that seem to be to sort of boil down to experiences of racism and, and maternal stress and et cetera. And so I think there is something there um, that we could quantify. I think in the medical genetics world, it's, it, we haven't really done it. We haven't incorporated a metric of experience of racism or just experience of trauma or experience of discrimination into our studies. Um, on the other hand, th this field of epigenetics is sort of, you know, really start starting to crystallize and the idea that there are potentially molecular markers of trauma or racism that you could measure is, is uh, tenable. And so th there may be in the future ways of measuring these things uh, using, you know, biochemistry or, or genetics or epigenetics. Um, and so I do think, you know, incorporating those as explicit variables into some of these studies is a, is an interesting idea. Um, I haven't seen it executed though, to answer your question directly. Yeah. All right. Peter. Yeah, I just want to make a couple of comments, really. Um, I think to address uh, Brett's uh, question, I mean, uh, a guy called William Dressler did some work on um, uh, hypertension amongst um, African descended populations in Africa, in the US and in the Caribbean. And I think he I think he introduced a, a, a kind of some kind of variable that, that tried to measure the experience of, of racism to account for those, those disparities. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say was in relation to what Santiago said about how in, um, how when white people were confronted with uh, data about COVID related, about um, racial disparities in, in COVID um, deaths and, 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 and morbidity and so on. I mean, that was something that struck me a lot in, in the UK, which was that you know when that data started to become available, it, it was publicised quite 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 a lot um, in the news, and suddenly you began to hear in the mainstream media the phrase structural racism more than you'd ever heard it before, um, and that was quite you know uh, um, striking, and that I thought oh great you know people are finally talking about structural racism to uh, you know to comprehend these these health disparities racialized health disparities. But because that kind of conversation also coincided with the whole Black Lives Matter uh, movement, right? You know, I mean, which which we felt uh, in the UK as well. Somehow that sort of um, got got co-opted by the right, uh, who took the kind of moral high ground and, and were against all this kind of you know talk of racism and and the whole kind of gaslighting. Um, uh, language and uh, the use of, sort of snowflake terminology and so on, you know, completely managed to subvert the apparent opening up of uh, a public conversation about structural racism. So, you know, I think it sort of that chimes a little bit with what Anne was saying about um, the power of the social forces that, you know, that continue to make race, race matter and to, and to subvert, you know, what seemed to be potentially um, um, interesting um, but political um, um, digressions. Thank you. So Anne. Yeah, I have uh, just a, a comment and a, a question. So um, 
the comment had to do with, we were talking a little bit earlier about the uses of the term ancestry sometimes as this sort of more palatable or apparently social, more socially uh, correct or politically correct version of um, race. And I think that, you know, what Santiago was saying was really make me actually think about the work of your colleague Vince, Julia Bayan, on, um, you know, looking and, and others who've looked at the uses of terminology in the printed literature, which I'm sure Santiago is more knowledgeable about than me. But, you know, I, I think that these studies are, are showing a very clear, in fact, if I think about this, even in my own study of textbooks over time, that, you know, there's this clear stepping away from the language of race, but hoping that ancestry can do that work. And I think, um, uh, for example, Catherine Bliss's work on sociogenomics, um, where she really insists that, you know, the continental ancestry idea, you know, the African, Asian, European schema has been sort of a way to repackage a race idea, I think is a really, it is one that really has to be taken seriously and, and paid attention to. And that, so her work also about sociogenomics made me think about the kinds of studies that Alicia was just pointing to. So, and I forget, you, you had a nice way of putting it, Alicia, I forget, but as sort of studies which of, of using polygenic risk scores for outcomes or phenotypes that have often been racialized historically. So educational outcome, um, educational comment with its sort of connotations also of intelligence and intellectual ability. And, and that made me kind of wonder, like, it sort of made me wonder, what are sociogenomicists thinking about when focusing on their picking the topics? You know, is there just this like gravitational pull towards like sticking your finger in a light socket and, and trying to pick these third rail topics? Um, and that and that made me think about the question that I wanted to pose to Santiago, and that is about um, actually the place of whiteness in the conduct of genomics. I think that's a really you know I think that's something that um, hasn't explicitly been taken up for very much for all kinds of reasons. And I'll note that interestingly enough in our charge to our uh, National Academies um, panel on population descriptors, which again is public, um, it says clearly, you know, we are not to take up consideration of issues of racism in science. So that's not on the table for us. And again, that would be a whole huge big other thing. So understandably it's not, I think in our remit, but but it's interesting, it also means that I think the kind of questions that you're asking Santiago, um, you know, are, are, are not gonna be made so tractable. And so my, I guess the question that I wanted to ask you in all of this were, was if you could just say a little bit more about the different channels through, or mechanisms by which you think whiteness is shaping the conversations that we're having about race in, in genetics. Yeah, I mean, I think, it's unfortunate that I mean, obviously, it's too big of a of a challenge to think about. But I think I think about like the experience of like my colleagues who are black, Mexican, Asian, Asian American, and they're trying to become scientists and what their experiences are like in labs. And I really do think that we can't be having this conversation about equity around race without having that conversation also, because this isn't just about equity of like data, like it's not just like whose bodies are being counted kind of thing. Like it should be equity at all levels in terms of representation and position. And just obviously like attrition is a problem and like the National Academies has like numerous programs trying to make sure that it's trying to like not lose people of color through the pipeline, but it's nonetheless happening. <clears throat> and I think unless we can really sit with like that question of like, how am I as a white person feeling about the work that I'm doing and why, why am I interested in these questions and who's, who's, who is it benefiting? You know, like obviously like the benefit, the medical benefit is like one thing, but then also like how am I as someone who's on a panel or who is like speaking to this issue, well, how am I accruing Uh, reputation or how am I accruing social capital on the basis of my interaction or my positioning as somebody who's doing anti-racist work and obviously I, I really think that your 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 point that if we're not using if we're not thinking about how is my science anti-racist like you're probably going to end up reproducing racism there's a way of doing that without taking up the space of a 
person of a scientist who's black or of a scientist who's Mexican or like not you know like not not like doing it for yourself like if you're doing anti-racist work like it's a lot like I like it's it's a lot for the people that have to do it and so to like just ask people like how like you know do more anti-racist science that's going to be like a whole ball game like it's going to be a whole ball and unless we can think about you know interpersonally how is like the exclusion of like Asian American scientists happening? How is like the exclusion of like, you know, and it's happening differently. And how is this like triangulation within the professional context taking place? Like it, it's hard to 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 move forward, I think, in this sphere without having that conversation. Um, looks like Alicia has something to say. Yeah. I'll just add up for Alicia. And I, I also want to say that I think it's not just a question for biological scientists. I think that it's a question for us in the social sciences too. I just want to make clear on that score. Definitely. Yeah, totally. I hear so many things that you're saying, Santiago, and it just like makes me think about the incentive system in science and the opportunities in science. So the incentive system in science, we can sort of touch on a little bit. That's a huge morass, but like thinking about um, who's involved in science is, or who's involved in genetic studies, for example, is directly influenced by who is running the genetic studies. So like, if you're looking at the greatest, like the most correlated reflection of who's in our genetic studies right now, it's like, not a great reflection of the world. It's not a great reflection of the US, uh, one of the biggest funders of biomedical science. It's a great, uh, it's got a great correlation though with like NIH funded investigators and their background. So like those folks who are doing the studies are studying folks who reflect their background as well. Um, so obviously like totally to your point, if we diversify who has access to be doing the studies that has a knock on effect in terms of who's represented. And maybe most, one thing that I think of as being really relevant to this is what things will we learn from doing more diverse science? Well, actually, by studying the same populations over and over again, we're learning less than if we diversified our studies. Our science gets better and we all win. We learn more new biomedical uh, findings. We generalize our findings better um, and we make access uh, better by having more diverse science. So like this whole incentive system, I think, needs to be aligned um, with both the ethics um, and the science both favoring more diversity in our science. So I just really appreciated your comments and wanted to mention that. Thank you. And thank you, Santiago and Alicia for bringing that frame to our conversation today. I'm, I'm gonna shift the frame for a minute and then I, I want us to move to the questions from the audience. Um, but I, I wanna talk about um, what I would describe as the general public. Uh, and, and they're thinking about these issues and issues of importance. And, and Brett, I wanna start out with you because as you were talking about your work in St. Louis and working in communities uh, and questions about data and data sharing and different models and what's the view that you're seeing uh, within the neighborhoods uh, within the city of St. Louis? Yeah, great question, Vince, thank you. Um, Yeah, this is interesting. Um, so, so one one thing that that we that Chelsea uh, Carter and I were really interested in learning from people um, was how they felt about um, sharing their data. Like, you know, people give blood, people donate organs. Um, these are things that happen, and um, uh, what about your genome? Like, what is it about the genome that maybe is different or or um, or uh, the same? And so we were we were really interested in asking people questions about who they're comf comfortable with having access to their genomic information. And um, we've gotten a whole lot of different answers, to tell you the truth. Uh, I think the the what we're finding is that the way people answer this question is often correlated with the way that they interact with technology. Um, though in some cases, it actually clashes with the way they interact with technology. And I think those are interesting cases to explore. So people who aren't concerned with, you know, uh, Google or Facebook or other technology companies using, you know, data uh, about them from 
you know, the, the internet, um, but are concerned about potentially sharing their medical information, their genome. And I think the conversations with these folks have been very, very illuminating. Um, and one thing that I'm finding, and I'm looking now for models about how to treat this, is that people see their genome as something precious, that it's, 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 it's something that they treasure, that, you know, ancestry, um, as much as it is related or not related to race, people, people, you know, in the general public are constantly conflating these terms as well. And so their genetics is part of their identity, um, not just in an ancestral sort of way, but in a racial sort of way, in a lot of people's view. Um, and so helping people think through that has been a real challenge, but also a real opportunity for us to say, okay, if people are treasuring their genome in this way and see it as really part of their identity and a, a, a part of their like community, um, how do we, how could we possibly own that information, right? And so how do we develop new models of sharing data, of um, gathering and collecting and storing data and owning data that see people and communities as co-owners, co-executors, co-decision makers about what happens to that data. And so there are some great models out there. Um, one that comes to mind is something that's happening with the Maori people in New Zealand who have basically stated that their genomes are treasured, that these are pieces of tribal property and that uh, anything that happens with that genomic data has to be um, you know, communally decided. And so I think those are things that I'm really interested in exploring locally in St. Louis and how do we um, think about what constitutes a community and who and how do we assign ownership and who, who gets to decide. So I think that's the most interesting and important thing that we've been finding so far. Thank you. So um, we're about to go to the questions uh, and I wanna ask one last question before we go to the questions. So the, the National Human Genome Research Institute published a strategic vision uh, in 2020 and it had 10 bold predictions. And one of the bold predictions that was included in that strategic plan was a prediction that genomics could move beyond re, uh, race. Now we've been talking about that, but I actually want each of you to tell me what you think of that bold prediction. And I will start with Anne. <laughs> I had a bad feeling you were gonna ask me that first. All right, before I answer though, you, you have to give me one piece of information, which is, am I correct in recalling that it, it not only made that prediction, but gave it a deadline like by 2030 or something like that? By 2030, that's By right. 2030, all right. So I think I'm gonna weasel out of this by saying that I do not believe that race will be gone from genomics by 2030, but I do believe that there is the potential for it to, to, uh, to disappear. And I wanna say maybe one little thing also that gets back to your previous question, um, Vince, about sort of the public thinking about this. And I think it's relevant yes. to this that, um, you know, Brett's comments were making me think about ways in which, you know, the public has come, has been led to often equate race with biology and with genetics in particular, because of all kinds of things like genetic ancestry testing, uh, also, forensic criminology, at least as it's uh, displayed on television. So I think there are these, you know, there are different ways, ideas also about disease. So I think there are a lot of different ways in which the, the public is continuing to be reinforced or get this reinforced message that our race is in our genes. It's, it's kind of who we are, as, you know, Brett put it very nicely. And I think because that message still has a lot of public purchase, I think it will be difficult to see genomics as a field step away from that altogether in the next eight years, but I do think it can be done. Okay, Santiago. I think it's unlikely um, that we'll move past race or move beyond race. I mean, my hope would be that we move past racial typologies and move towards analyses of the effects of structural racism. And so insofar as race will remain, I hope that it only remains in terms of the effects of the systems, social systems that perpetuate it and that position people in different places and social space on the basis of it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Peter, 
Uh, yeah, I think it's it's unlikely. Um, first, because as as long as um, geneticists continue to use social categories to organise their their data and their sampling, there's always the tendency, the possibility that those categories are somehow going to, perhaps not by the geneticists, but when their work gets out into the into the into the wider society, are going to be assimilated to familiar categories of, of race. And secondly, because um, you know, there are some geneticists out there who are saying that race actually, what genetics is showing us, is that race does have a biological basis to it. So, you know, and I mean, those guys, some of them, like David Rich and so on, are, you know, quite, I think, quite influential and quite well known, and they publish widely in the in the in the popular press and so on. So as long as that tiny minority of geneticists are out there and quite vocal, they're only going to add to the problem. Alicia? I think uh, that we'll move towards society having a better understanding of the nuances. So understanding what about ancestry can be learned from a chip for example, and learn that race and ethnicity have more to do with how you identify and how society identifies you. I don't think we will move beyond race in genomics. And I, as I think I've mentioned, think it would do us a disservice to try to totally decouple these things because I think it may exacerbate disparities to try to stop studying disparities, for example, or to include some measures of um, social variation um, in our studies. So I think that's my hopeful spot where we will land in the next 10 years or so. And Brett. Boy, I feel like the guy on the, you know, making football predictions when everybody's picked one team and you, you just can't all pick the same team to win. But I, I think I'm going to say uh, the same that I think it's, I do think it's unlikely. I'm going to go back to a point Anne made at the very beginning of her remarks, which is that until race is not a useful social construct, I, I don't know how we move past it in other fields. Um, I, I do think that one, you know, one, one issue within genetics that, that we're working on is this idea of a reference genome, which we haven't really talked about much at all actually today and the role that the reference genome plays in in genetics and um you know i know there's a there's we have the human pan genome project right which is looking to diversify the the reference genome and to create a a, a reference database of of genomes that are more reflective of the diversity of human beings and so i think the extent to which things like this can become useful tools in the field will allow for a more nuanced approach to classifying people. But until we, you know, some of those tools are available, I, I, I do feel like people will sort of regress to the, you know, um, the, the old, the, the ways that we're currently using, which, you know, puts race kind of front and center. Um, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you for uh, amusing me with the, the, the answering that question. So let's jump to the questions from our audience. So the first question is from Cameron. Uh, genetics are well aware of the biological climbs, but it appears that um, demographics reported in literature are still demarcated across linguistic uh, activism of race. Uh, what would you suggest as a framework for more precise articulation of genotypic diversity, especially for countries which strongly diverge from a genetic background indicative of an ethno state? The U.S. is an example. So who would like to answer that question? I can take a first stab at it, and I'm sure my colleagues will have a few things to add. Um, so geneticists are well-versed in methods like principal components analysis, which has been mentioned, which assigns a continuum to um, these concepts. And then as uh, my colleagues have also mentioned, there's often overlaid uh, labels on top of that. Um, that can be problematic 
On the other hand, sometimes I wonder what's the alternative. So we need to make our genetic studies useful and to the populations in which they represent. So I've heard some advocation for in principal component space, for example, um, doing away with labels and calling things A through Z. Um, but how does a population understand what their risk is if you call them A through Z and they don't have a way to apply that? So I think we need to come up with like a clear framework, frankly, to understand how um, the intersection of these clines fit um, without then adding on a whole series of stereotypes on top of that. So, you know, you might be at increased risk, but that doesn't mean that you're destined to have like extremely high prevalence just because of your background. Um, I think we need to layer on that nuance as we start to communicate this kind of science. Um, and this can be really tricky in a place like the US that has such strong, um, as mentioned, is, is like a really strongly uh, divided place sometimes along racial and ethnic lines. Um, when we're doing our studies, I think it's also important that we're clear if there's a statistical need to um, analyze populations in separate ways, why? Like, what is the reasoning that we might need to do that? How does that um, impact our genetic findings? Um, how does that help um, the science become more robust if that's the case? And are we at danger for interpreting things um, inappropriately when we do things uh, that way? Um, I'm sure other folks have things to add to that, but kicking us off. <laughs> Others? Um, yeah, I'll say keep your eye out for a publication next week. Um, that might answer your question a little bit, Cameron. Um, I'd say like in terms of clarifying, like I doubt one framework will supplant existing ones. So it's gonna be hard to do that. Um, and especially one that would be as comprehensive as to understand all the different ways in which humans can be, humans can be different like difference, like somebody else is making you look different than another. Um, I, I definitely think it lies in understanding and developing a more sophisticated understanding of ancestry um, that can help clarify the interaction between environmental determinants of biology and the, so and the genetic determinants of, of health or biology. Um, so yeah. I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm curious about this connection to like in an ethno state, because I think the same would apply in like a very homogeneous country as well, um, because all countries have genetic diversity and they have pushed for the perception of having more homogenous populations as part of very intense political projects. And so it's not just the US where, you know, we're a melting pot where this is the case you, you could ask the same question of any other state uh, yeah hold on i had to jump in santiago you have to tell us what the publication is that we're looking out for next week and i have a question for you about it having not even seen it which is um i'm curious to know what role geography might play in this whatever this thing that is that will be unveiled so i mean we're mostly uh, so it, I can't say because it's embargoed, but the um, it's a res, it's some early results from from the project that I talked about today, and I, I already gave some some headway into what that would look like. Geography is definitely a big question here, and I think a lot of what we discuss in the paper is that the idea that continental ancestry is somehow a thing it, it has many issues, and so that's kind of what we're we're, we're thinking. There's a lot of ways in which geography is very complex though. And so obviously like Caribbean versus um, West African versus African-American or, you know, if you're in the South or something like that, like it's gonna, it's like very different. And and there's a lot of good work out there that's trying to, to understand that, especially, I think maybe we can think about mig migratory histories and their relevance to how we come up with these categories. And I mean, I'm always in for pitching for more historians in, in different, spheres, but I think collaborating with historians and environmental historians would be really helpful here. Yeah, I, I keep thinking, I'll add before Peter jumps in, that I, I keep thinking that, you know, geography offers us this wonderfully scalable variable to work with, right? We don't, we're not condemned to work with continental ancestry groups, right? We can be more precise, more um, fine-grained, and so I'm always interested in that, but I will, I will keep my eyes peeled next week. <laughs> 
sorry, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to um, share a sc my screen here to show this, which is um, a PCA analysis uh, from the Mexican Genome Project. And you know, it uses geography. So this green blob here is Yoruba population from Ibadan. And this uh, blob here is um, Chinese people from Beijing and Japanese people from Tokyo. So these are quite specific things. And uh, you know, but those get simplified into that, into the thing that I showed you before, which just breaks it down into indigenous, indigenous European and African. So, you know, there's that constant slippage from the very specific to the much more general. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. So I'm gonna to go to one last question uh, and then I'm just gonna ask um, for everyone on the panel to just give a last reflection uh, before we end the day. So the last question is, thanks all. On this theme of molecular markers of racism, how do we promote racial justice and address the ways in which race produces biological effects without perpetuating the idea that life sciences occupy a place in ontological privilege when it comes to race? In other words, how do we proactively address racial disparities while also avoiding suggesting that race and its effects are only real or legible if they can be explained in a biological register? and likewise are not real if they cannot be. Or in, in still other words, how do we integrate scientific anti-racism with an interest in proactive racial justice and with understandings of race that will go beyond what biology has to say about it? So as people respond to that question, I would ask that you give any last reflections as we come to the end of our hour. So I'll start with Peter. Oh boy, okay, uh, you caught me unawares there. Um, okay. I mean, I think um, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to what Santiago was saying about uh, the need to address racism and the effects of racism, which do have, you know, can have, as, as Brett was saying, a kind of a biological impact. And that's been shown many times. Um, so the whole notion of developmental biology and epigenetics so not to think that just because something's biological it's necessarily fixed and totally determined but to understand biology as itself a social uh, and cultural process rather than something that's completely separate from the social and the cultural you know my my, my sense is that that's the the way might be a way in which to introduce uh, bring together anti-racism and the biological and the cultural into uh, a single kind of frame, if you like. Thank you. Uh, Brett. Yeah, uh, Peter, you, you, you're, on, you're on to something that I was going to say, which is that it, it, I do think it's in the um, sort of just this, the acknowledgement that there, there isn't really an ontological privilege that biology has in, in, in this particular area that um, or, or, or maybe a better way to put it is that genetics doesn't have an ontological privilege that, you know, genetics is sort of this fixed thing. Um, but biology itself is adaptive and it's responding to a, a social environment. And so the acknowledgement that a biological marker, which, which may reflect the effects of, of experiencing racism is not necessarily, you know, predetermined by, by anything genetic, but it's actually an integration of, of genetics and the environment. Now, the question of whether, you know, if we can't biologically measure something, does it not exist? I, I actually, I'm not sure if I have a good response to that. I, I think that's something I'll probably be pondering the rest of the, the afternoon and evening. Um, and, and I think that's a really important question. Uh, hopefully someone else will have a, some insight on that. Alicia. Um, I think towards this idea of promoting anti-racist science, especially in the context of um, genetics, I don't see genetics as the path to being super anti-racist. I think it comes, you, genetics may be a tool for bringing data together, um, including from socio-environmental factors and how society thinks about or how society influences disease risk, uh, genetics alone is not influencing um, 
like health disparities or health outcomes um, in in a racialized way. So I think it's really important that we just as a you know note to end on integrate our genetic and environmental studies more um, more and more. Uh, and then maybe just as another note to end on, you know, society doesn't necessarily love reading uh, primary literature. <laughs> and so in advocating for this, I think we also need to be cognizant of how we're communicating this. So when we have the most societally relevant um, points distilled down very clearly, I think we make those societally important points in a nuanced way um, in collaboration with folks who are excellent science communicators um, to get the messages of uh, clear distinctions between what you can learn from ancestry, what you can learn um, by a, by using other types of data uh, together to understand health disparities. Thank you, Santiago. Yeah, I think Andy asked a really good question here, and I I, I do think that I could say, kumbaya, interdisciplinarity is the way to go, and everybody needs to just integrate more social scientists into their genomics. But I know that the reality is that funding disparities are extremely real and the hierarchy of the sciences is very robust and very strong. Like you just need to look at like funding directives to know that. And I think unless we can really challenge the way that funding is set up in the sciences, it's unlikely to, to actually change. And we're gonna continue to privilege biological understandings of reality or racism. And it's not that like when, when social scientists say, this is socially constructed. We're not saying it's not real. We're saying it's very real, but it has a social ideology, which means that how we talk about it, what we do and what we say and the politics around it really matter. And so I think I would say that we need to uh, not just talk the talk, but like <laughs> here, like actually go like, like when you're, when you're working on a grant and like think about, okay, how can I collaborate with a social scientist on this and what would that look like? And how can I make sure that we're devoting resources towards the study of the social phenomenon just as much as we are devoting resources to the study of the biological phenomenon? So, Anne, you have the last word. I knew you were going to do me a, a solid one here, Vince, and not make me go first, so I would get to be last this time. So, um, so I actually, uh, following up on Santiago, I, I'm going to make a plea for the Kumbaya moment. For the the crossing of disciplinary boundaries, I think that's that's part of the the solution, and I'm I'm delighted to see different ways in which that that's happening. But I also really want to second um, what he acknowledged about the une uneven playing field between the social and the natural sciences, let alone the humanities, and that's really part of what is going on when we're privileging certain accounts. Um, uh, you know, biological accounts of the, the reality or not of race. Um, I'll note, though, it's interesting that there are other domains where that might also come into play that it doesn't, because there is something about race and its sensitivity and its social sensitivity. For example, religious groups are real. I think we can all acknowledge nobody is concerned about whether they are rooted in biology or not. That's not a discourse we have. We can accept them as real without them being biologically real. So it raises the question of why race why is race different? Why do we have to somehow have biologists tell us whether it is, is real or not? And that's, I think, because it's, it's, um, it's serving a lot of different purposes today for stratification. And race needs the aura of biological fixedness to do the kind of work that it is generally employed to do in our society. It makes it a, an unusual case. The last thing I, I guess that I'll say about um, uh, you know, moving forward, I think another challenge that we're facing is simply that particularly in the United States, we are not very good at recognizing the social. Like as Americans, we're all down for individualist accounts, like our own agentic, pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, making things happen in the world, we get that. So we can get explanations of things that are very essential that have to do with individual capacities. We also, some of us may be very attuned to kind of broader sort of supernatural accounts, you could say of the world of how religious forces create the world and where we are missing, where we're not good at is really thinking about how collectively as a society, we bring about outcomes like making race real and, and even making race biologically real in a sense in terms of its, its effects expressed through the body. 
um, through illness and so forth. So, um, so I, I think that in a sense, there's a lot of other areas, ways in which we think about the world, the social world and about difference that will have to change as well for us to really make progress and think new ways about the intersection of, of race in the body and race and genomics in particular. Great. Thank you. This was a great panel. I want to just thank everyone for participating and back to Paul. Thank you so much. I, this was fantastic. To those of you who, who are with us to the end and to our panelists and to Vince Bonham for moderating, I, I, we haven't solved inequality in, in an hour and 45 minutes, but we certainly have addressed uh, and answered a lot of complex questions in nuanced and, and, and thought-provoking ways. Thank you so much on behalf of the Science and Human Culture Program and the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Equity at Washington University in San Luis. We hope to see you at future events. Uh, take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Bye -bye. To our panelists, there is a comment from Alan Templeton in the uh, Q&A here about uh, geographic diversity. I don't know if you can all see this. Um, we have some, I don't, know, I don't know who I'm speaking to here, I think, <laughs> for the audience. Uh, Billy, are you there? Could you pop on for a second? I don't know if, uh, I don't see him right away. I can't. I have Paul because I, I have to go. You have right to run, now. yes. So I have to if, run. If, if, if you have a, if you, yes, please, if you have a, um, take care. If you, if Thank you, you have all. a, if you have a, uh, uh, those of you who have a, a, a stipend honorarium, uh, I don't know what to call this, uh, coming, uh, Billy, is, 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 a, is, is, is Tila reaching out to, to folks uh, at this point or what happens? So yeah, just... yeah, we should, we're in touch with everybody. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, we'll uh, we'll just follow up on all the details there. Okay, Vince, thank you so much. Yeah, I thought it was a yeah, great well, panel. Thank you. That was really okay. great. That was really fantastic. Thanks so much, guys. I hope to see you soon and, and have dinner at some point. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks for having Bye. us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Talk to John here. Uh, Billy, are, are we all set? Yeah, we're all set. Um, okay. It looks like, yeah, everybody's off except for the two of us and our, our uh, IT webinar colleague. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, that, that was great conversation. Uh, the recording's done, right? It's, uh, oh, cut it off. Yeah, so it's well, it's still recording. We can chop it at the end. That was okay. that was phenomenal. I thought so too. I thought I was blown away. You know, there weren't a lot of questions from the audience, but it didn't end up really mattering that much. I I um I thought that was it was so. I mean, you know, getting people to talk across disciplines this way. I, I, there was so much clarity and 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 great questions and. Um, I mean, I was even thinking of stuff that, you know, I want to share with my students now in classes. So I, I, I hope, who knows, you know, what the audience took away, but I, I was, I'm really happy with that. I, I thought it was, I mean, it was, it was uh, pretty well attended. I think there were 60 some at one point um, yeah. that I saw in the numbers. I really appreciated the fact that, you know, Peter was able to connect with Santiago or vice versa, right? Um, yeah. That Santiago and Alicia made the connection, you know, Santiago and Anne Morning. Yeah, um, 